Hey everyone, uh, it's great to be with you as we dive in to Matthew 26. Uh, you can go ahead and get your Bible here. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 26. And as I was reflecting on, you know, what, um, as we were studying this past week's lesson, uh, there were some concepts and some words I think that BSF really wanted us to focus on from this week's lesson, and I really do appreciate that. Um, and there were a few concepts that were pretty clear that that we should grasp from this passage that were pretty clear throughout Matthew 26. And I I really focused on three. Um, The first one was this idea of faithfulness. What does faithfulness look like? This idea of redemption that was actually the doctrine for this week in Matthew 26 for your lesson. And then this idea of obedience. What is obedience? What is, how does it relate to Christian living? And as you know, I like to start my lectures by asking a few questions uh, to really get us to think deeper about the passage. And I, I narrowed it down to three main questions in terms when we think about faithfulness, redemption, and obedience in the context of this first part of Matthew chapter 26. So the first question I came up with, and these are just questions for you to ponder. We're going to be referring uh, back to them throughout the lecture. Um, but the first question is, where in your life do you need to be reminded of Jesus's absolute faithfulness? You know, simple question, right? Where should you where should you be reminded of Jesus's faithfulness? Is it in your career? Maybe a relationship or maybe the lack of one? Uh, is it maybe the uncertain future or even the uncertain present that you face? Or maybe it's you want to see God's faithfulness in your past. So three questions. So that's the first question. Where in your life do you need to be reminded of Jesus's absolute faithfulness? The second question is where in your life do you need to experience Redemption, you know, this idea, this action where Jesus purchases his people and redeems them and gives them new life through Jesus's death and resurrection. Jesus purchased his people for debt. So where do you need in your life? Do you need to experience Jesus's redemption? And when I think about redemption, I think about um, the poor choices that I've made, right? Um, the... Maybe it's the pain and the bitterness of my past. Uh, maybe it's sin that you're currently struggling, struggling with, that you're currently facing. Where in your life do you need to experience Jesus' redemption? And where in your life do you want to experience the freedom that comes with glorifying Jesus, the true and perfect master? Where in your life do you want to experience the freedom that comes with glorifying Jesus, the true and perfect master? And I think that ties in a little bit to obedience, right? So we're going to, in this passage ahead, we're going to see how all of these come together in Matthew 26. We're going to see Jesus's absolute faithfulness. We're going to see radical obedience from Jesus in the face of suffering. And then we're going to see God's redemptive plan for the world starting to unfold. Uh, The lecture today is divided into two main sections. The first division being faithfulness to the plan. That's Matthew 26 verses 1 through 13. And Division 2, Faithfulness Through the Pain, Matthew 26, verses 14 through 46. So let me pray for us real quick, and then we'll dive into the passage. Uh, Lord, I thank you that you're giving us this time to just take a pause from the world around us and uh, just to focus on your word, your true living word. Jesus, give us eyes to see what you have for us in this passage and remind us, Lord, that our lives are built on your perfect faithfulness, your perfect obedience, and your redemption. Jesus, the relationship we have with you starts and ends with us. Would you remind us that of that today, Lord? And would that give us the confidence to live in the freedom that you have called us to, the freedom from sin and death? And it's your son's great name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Okay, division one, faithfulness to the plan. This is Matthew 26, verses 1 through 13. These are the beginning stages of Jesus Um, of Jesus' suffering before he gets to Calvary, before he gets to the cross. You know, in the last couple of weeks, as a quick refresher, Jesus, uh, you know, Jesus has been talking about his second coming, the importance of being ready for Jesus' return at any moment. And then this week, in the opening verses of Matthew 26, we are now entering into the moment of Jesus' suffering, right? As I mentioned, the beginning of the redemptive plan that the Father has set in motion, in the upcoming weeks, so let's be honest, are going to be emotional. They are going to be heartbreaking uh, as we read about the pain that our Savior experiences. But it's also going to be glorious. 
um, as we, as the reality of the gospel sinks into our hearts, right? I pray that in our prayer, I pray that the gospel becomes real to us in these moments. Um, because the fact of the matter is the son of man came to suffer and die. And on our behalf, he goes through that intense pain so that we can find redemption, salvation, forgiveness of sins, eternal life. And that so we could be restored back to our creator, back to God. So in a way it is painful, but in a way it's also glorious. And the first couple of verses from Matthew 26 open us up to this grand event. And Jesus is explaining uh, to his disciples that as Passover is taking place, so too will the Son of Man be handed over to be crucified. And once again, he's being upfront and honest as he has been in the past with the disciples of what is going to happen to him in the coming days. And simultaneously, Matthew tells us the chief priests and the elders are planning Jesus' death. And we've known all along that the religious leaders of the day were not fans of Jesus. They've been wanting to get Jesus out of the picture for a long time. Jesus has been a threat to them in popularity terms. He's a threat to their lifestyle, to their hypocrisy. They want to get rid of Jesus. And we see those plans um, ruminating and finally taking shape here. But I think in these opening verses, a lot is happening, but this word Passover is being thrown out a lot in these opening verses. So I think it's a good time to ask, what was the Passover? It's a good refresher for us, even if we know what the Passover is. What is the significance? Why is chapter 26? Uh, so I'm going to take you, I'm going to ask you to take a quick sidestep back. Book of Exodus, uh, the Hebrews, God's chosen people, were actually in captivity, in slavery in Egypt. And if you remember, Pharaoh was uh, the leader of Egypt, and the Pharaoh was a hard-hearted man. He was prideful. He was arrogant. And in that arrogance, he refused to free the Hebrews from their bondage. And God, in his protection and power, sends 10 plagues on Egypt to get Pharaoh to free God's people. But the final plague, the 10th plague, was the most significant. It was when the angel of death would come upon Egypt and kill the firstborn male of every household. However, the Hebrews were going to be spared from this tragedy because the Hebrews were called to sacrifice the lamb, post the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, and if they had that blood on the doorpost, the blood of that lamb, the angel of death would pass over the households of the Hebrews and their firstborn males would be spared. And of course, this happens. If you had put the blood of the lamb on your doorpost, you were spared that tragedy. And if you remember, um, as recorded in Exodus, Pharaoh relents and allows the Hebrews to leave Egypt and they are freed from slavery. And this is what Israel is commemorating. This is what they're talking about when they refer to the Passover in Matthew 26. He's about, and um, when we think about that, um, when we think about Jesus referring to Passover, what are the dots? What, what are some dots that we can connect? What is the significance of the Passover to the here and now, what we're reading in, Matthew, in, this, in these opening verses of Matthew, of this chapter in Matthew? Uh, well, as I mentioned, this is the setting of Jesus's life. This is the end of Jesus's life that we are walking into. And that's going to culminate in his crucifixion on the cross. And he is going to die on that cross. But his death is not an ordinary death. His death is a death that frees his people from certain slavery, slavery to sin and death. And Christ's blood poured out. And we're going to read about that a little bit more uh, in Matthew 26. But Christ's blood poured out. It's like the blood of the lamb on the, on the doorpost. Christ's blood poured out for us will be our gate. Life will be our gateway to freedom. Jesus is our Passover lamb. Maybe you've been around church for a long time or you've heard this phrase before, the lamb of God. This is what we mean when we refer to Jesus as the lamb of God. He is the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. He is our ultimate Passover lamb because he's going to shed his blood for the sins of many and accomplish our redemption and our freedom. But before, before we get to that point, a few significant events happen and take place. And the first one of those events is in Matthew 26, verses 6 through 13, when Jesus is anointed by a woman at Bethany. And in, in 
verse 6, Jesus arrives, the scripture tells us, at the home of Simon the leper. And in this moment, when Jesus is reclining at the table, a woman pours a very expensive perfume over his head. So obviously the disciples, as we read, have a disappointing reaction to this. They have a poor reaction to this woman. But we have to ask, before we get into their bad reaction, what's happening here? Why would the woman do this? Uh, you know, some historical context that I think is helpful here is that it was a common custom for people to anoint um, bodies with perfume before burial, to prepare a body for burial. And in this fact, Jesus acknowledges that this woman is doing it exactly that. This woman is preparing Jesus' body for his death, for his burial. And I think this is significant right? because the disciples have this curmudgeon attitude towards this woman. You know, they think this, this expensive perfume was wasted on Jesus. And, it, you know, that bottle of perfume could have been sold and the money per- uh, used to take care of the poor, right, is what the disciples say. Reaction to what this woman is doing. You think back to previous interactions that the disciples had when Jesus was trying to tell them about his death on the cross, his ultimate mission on this earth, which was to die. It seems like they never ultimately grasped what Jesus was saying. They never really understood. Maybe they weren't really listening ultimately. Whatever it was, whatever their distraction, this woman was listening. She was understanding that Jesus was going to die. And she was preparing Jesus. Jesus acknowledges this. She takes a step of faith, of boldness, and she anoints Jesus. And it's this beautiful act of humility, of sacrifice, of adoration before Jesus. This bottle of perfume, expensive perfume, was not wasted on the Son of Man. And in fact, Jesus um, states the significance of this interaction with this woman, where Jesus says in verse 13, this story is going to be told around the world where the gospel is preached. And it is, because hey, Here we are in 21st century America, 2,000 years after this event took place, thousands of miles away from where this originally took place. So what Jesus says, of course, comes true. This story is told all over the world where the gospel is proclaimed. But all of these interactions are pointing us to the main purpose for Jesus' life on this earth, that Jesus had come to earth to die, to be our Passover lamb. And we can't miss the significance of that because it's going to lead to our first principle here where Jesus faithfully submits to his part in sinners. Jesus faithfully submits to his part in God's plan to redeem sinners. So let's think back to the beginning of this lecture. And uh, I had asked a few questions, right? Where do you see God's faith? Where do you want to see God's faithfulness in your life? Or maybe where do you want to be made more aware of God's faithfulness? Where do you want to experience God's redemption? And where in your life do you want to experience the freedom that comes knowledge a few things in light of some of the questions that I asked, right? So we have to understand that when we talk about our faithfulness to God, when we talk about obedience in the Christian life, it should never start with us. Why? Well, we're going to see, especially in this next division, Mankind are very much unfaithful. We are very much disobedient. And don't even get started into this topic of redemption. We have no power to redeem our own lives. We have no human power to redeem our souls. We cannot bridge the gap between man and God on our own. We need Jesus. And I want us to get a clear picture of what's happening here. When we think about our life as a whole, maybe when you think about sins that you've committed or the sins that you struggle with or the pain of your past, and things were caused towards you, they were done unto you. When we think about those things, when we think about the reality of our fallen nature, we feel helpless and hopeless. We long for things to be made right. We long for things... To me, to be renewed. And 
also to give us the life that we desperately needed. And one day, he's going to even restore the pain of our past, present, and future when that is ultimately accomplished in his second coming. Jesus is 100% faithfully obedient to the Father's plan to redeem humanity. He accomplishes what we never could. This is his main mission on this earth. And I'm going to ask you to do a hard thing as we wrap up here this first division. And it's going to be a, a difficult ask, but I just want us to start thinking about these things as we get to the conclusion here as we're wrapping up this first part of Matthew 26. But I want you to think about what I just talked about. Some of those, maybe some of those regrets. Maybe some of those sins that you struggle with. Maybe you think about some of the bitterness of the past or the pain of the past. I'm going to ask you to do something difficult. I want you to maybe think about some of those things. Bring them to the the surface as the Spirit leads as we dive into Matthew 26. I want you to think about them because we're not going to leave them there. We're going to bring them to Jesus. So I'm going to start thinking about some of the things in my own life, in my own heart. Some of the pain and the poor choices and the, the regret that I've experienced in my own life. I'm going to bring, bring that to the surface because I'm going to want to bring it to Jesus who redeems every aspect of our life. He redeems our souls, but he also redeems even the broken tragedies of our life. And we want to bring that to him. The 100% faithful Jesus, the perfectly obedient Savior. So, again, it's a difficult thing, I know. Bring some of those difficult things to the surface, those burdens that maybe are overwhelming your soul. Bring them to mind. We're not going to leave them there. We're going to bring them to Jesus. So with that, let's dive into the second division as we talk through the faithfulness, through the pain, Matthew 26, verses 14 through 46. Faithfulness through the pain, Matthew 26, verses 14 through 46. You know, this next part of Matthew 26 is a lot of verses, Uh, so we're going to break it up in a few sections. Actually, it'll be three sections we're going to break it up into. Uh, The first section is the Last Supper. The second section is Peter's Denial. And then the third section is the Garden of Gethsemane. So those are our three main sections here in verses 14 through 46. So let's start here with the Last Supper, verses 17 through 30. By the way, we're going to tackle verses 14 through 16 in this section. Uh, That is a big part of all of these sections at some point. So we are going to touch on what happens in verses 14 through 16 in a moment. Uh, But again, verses 17 through 19, as we start here with the Last Supper, uh, you know, here we go, right? We're talking about the Passover again. Jesus is having his disciples make preparations for the Passover. of the Last Supper. Now, the first item of business, the first on Jesus' agenda here for the Last Supper is to tell the disciples that someone is going to betray him. And this sends the disciples into a frenzy, right? You know, they're asking, is it going to be me, Lord? Am I going to be the one who's going to betray you? Of course, we know the answer to that question that was in verses 14 through 16. And Jesus later reveals as well that Judas... One of the 12 disciples is going to be the one to betray him. And when I was writing this, I, you know, I was thinking about why Judas decided to betray Jesus. And I probably overcomplicate Judas. Um, But I think in summary, Jesus was, as I mentioned about the religious leaders, right? They're fed up with Jesus. I think Judas was fed up with Jesus as well. And I don't know if Jesus ever believed Jesus was the, excuse me, if Judas had ever believed Jesus was the Messiah, but Judas was certainly done with what Jesus had been saying and doing. And I think maybe he had been uncomfortable by some of Jesus's pronouncements as being the son of God, his statements on his divinity, maybe his prophecies uh, that he was talking about in terms of his second coming in the future. Or maybe he was, he would get uncomfortable when Jesus would refer would refer to the Old Testament and say that he was the fulfillment of Old Testament scriptures. Whatever it was, Judas had had enough with Jesus. And in his corrupted heart, just like the religious leaders, he believed Jesus had to be stopped, that Jesus had crossed a line and it was time for him to be handed over. And it was such a, it's such a heartbreaking thing to read about. 
uh, because Judas all along through Jesus's earthly ministry was looking at Jesus in the flesh. He was looking at the son of man, the Messiah in the flesh, and yet he still refused to trust in Jesus, to truly believe in him. We'll touch on betrayal and denial a little bit more in the next section, but I think there's a lesson here for us. The world is filled with people who are okay with Jesus for a certain amount of time. What do I mean by that? Well, there's certain people that are okay with the moral teacher, Jesus, right? The one who's, you know, the Jesus who's just here to teach us some good moral lessons. He he talks about some good things for relationships and, and, you know, a lot of people in this world are okay with that. They're okay with Jesus as a moral teacher. Then when you start talking about Jesus, the real Jesus as revealed in scripture, you know, his godhood, him being Messiah, his glory, his true mission on earth to seek and save the lost, which is all of us, people start to get really uncomfortable by that. Many people, by the way, who claim to be Christians, who go to church every week on Sunday, they get uncomfortable with Jesus as discovered in the scriptures. And that's the reality of the fallen world we live in. Not everyone will accept Jesus for who he really is. And we can't be surprised by this. That's just reality. And maybe it's time for us to do a quick heart heart check, right? To say, hey, do we really believe in the real and true Jesus? The Jesus that was revealed in the scriptures. It's something for us to ponder. And it's also something to just remember that's a reality on this fallen world. Not everybody will trust and believe in Jesus. Judas and the religious leaders are a perfect example. They saw Jesus with their own eyes in the flesh, and they refused to believe. So with that in mind, after this betrayal, Judas's betrayal is revealed, Jesus is also going to demonstrate some symbolism. And this is with, uh, in the last supper here in verses 26 through 29, Jesus uses the bread and the wine In the meal, and he explains how his blood will be poured out for the forgiveness of sins, his body broken and given for us. And um, if you've been, again, if you've been around church for a while, you might uh, have heard uh, Christians call this communion or the Lord's Supper. uh, Because this is actually a tradition that is practiced by Christians all over the world. It's important to talk about this, though, because it's not just some religious ritual or tradition that we institute for our church program. And it's just an order of service. Now, there's a reason behind why Jesus told us to remember this always whenever we got together. It's a time for us believers, those have come, who have come to Jesus in repentance and trust to remember our salvation, to remember the sacrificial Passover lamb, the lamb of God, Jesus, who takes away our sins, to remember our redemption, that his body was broken for us, his blood poured out for us to wash away our sins and make us new. And whether your church celebrates it once a week or once a month, this is what we Christians mean when we celebrate the Lord's Supper or communion. And this reflection, reflecting on Jesus' sacrifice for us, is not just for church on Sunday, but it's really, I think it's a call for us always, every single day, to remember the gospel, to proclaim the gospel for ourselves, to remember how Jesus accomplished redemption for us and how Jesus accomplished redemption for the world and how to proclaim that to others. So that's the Lord's Supper. That's this significant moment that takes place. And then verse 30 tells us that they, you know, in this beautiful fashion, Jesus and his disciples sing a hymn and they go out to the Mountain of Olives. And we were talking about that as a leadership circle at our leaders meeting, how beautiful it was that Jesus sang a hymn with his disciples. I don't know what about that. It's just to think about Jesus singing with his disciples. We talked about how beautiful that was. That is a beautiful picture of what Jesus is doing there. Uh, the section of this portion, um, um, and, and this section of, of Matthew 26 here, this next section that we're talking about, that's the Lord's Supper that wraps up there in verse 30. Now moving on here to verses 31 through 35 when we're reading about Peter's future, future denial the scattering of the disciples that Jesus foretells here. Uh, Because Jesus predicts that the disciples are going to be scattered once Jesus is arrested. And it was going to happen actually later that night. And of course, this happens just as Jesus predicts. But Peter, of course, opens his mouth and insists that he would never deny Jesus. And Peter actually does this twice. Um, We did talk as a leadership circle. One of our leaders brought up that we shouldn't be too hard on Peter in this moment just because, you know, if you think about these disciples had been with Jesus his entire 
earthly ministry for these three years. Uh, Peter had a lot of zeal and love and, and, and worship for the Lord and passion for the Lord. So we shouldn't be too hard on him for that reason. Um, but the fact is, Jesus predicts that the disciples um, were to fall away and Peter was going to be part of that. Peter was actually going to deny Jesus. But again, I think there's a lesson here in when we think about the true mission of what Jesus was doing on the earth, right? The, the plan that was set forth by the Father in his perfect timing and his perfect providential will was that Christ would be born of a virgin. He would live on this earth, this perfect sinless life. He would die for the sins of mankind, and then he would rise again on the third day. This is the mission of Jesus. This was his purpose on this earth, and this mission could not be stopped. It could not be stopped. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, the elders, Judas, one of his own disciples, tried to stop him. They've had enough of him. The Romans will crucify Jesus. Even his own disciples will demonstrate unfaithfulness. They'll deny Jesus. They will scatter and abandon him. None of that wavers Jesus' ultimate mission. Nothing can stop God's perfect will from taking place. Jesus' redemption for you and for me, what he accomplished on his cross and in his glorious resurrection, isn't based on external circumstances. It is not based on you. It is not based on me. It is not based on our willingness or, or ability to try, uh, or, or faithfulness, right? Our level of faithfulness. It's not based on that. It's not based on our level of obedience. It is sustained by what Jesus already accomplished. It is sustained by Jesus' perfect faithfulness and obedience to his Father on the cross. It's not based on us. Jesus' salvation for us doesn't depend on us, but it depends on what he did in his cross and in his resurrection. See, the fact of the matter is we often fail Jesus. Jesus' own disciples, his best friends on planet Earth, failed Jesus. We fail Jesus, but Jesus never fails us. And even after we're saved, by the way, spoil alert, right? We still sin after we're saved. But even then, even after we've been saved and redeemed and made new, it is still not our works or our level of faithfulness that sustains our relationship with Christ. It is Christ himself. Just as nothing could hinder Jesus's mission on earth, nothing can separate us from our relationship with Christ because it all depends on Jesus and it doesn't depend on us. So that's that second section there uh, when we talk about Peter's denial. And then this final portion of the scripture passage is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in verses 36 through 46. For me, this was the most powerful portion of what we read in Matthew 26. Uh, really, if you think about it, it is the dark night of the soul for Jesus. And it's a very powerful part of the passage uh, and I think, you know, we've heard entire sermons on the Garden of Gethsemane, but we only have a couple minutes to really talk about the significance of what takes place here. But in verses 36 through 46, I really think that we see the fullness of who Jesus is, his humanity on display and his divinity. You know, we've talked about it a lot this year in our study of Matthew, but we talk about this, you know, the Trinity. God is three in one. We do not serve three separate gods. We serve one God in three person. It is the mystery of the Trinity. And then we also have the mystery of the second person of the Trinity. It's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The second person of that Trinity is Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man. And in this mystery, we Scripture tells us that Jesus was fully God. He's also fully man. And when you think about how both uh, have been revealed to us as we studied Matthew. You know, I think about, for example, in Matthew 4, when Jesus was tempted in the desert by the devil. That was a, a window into Jesus's humanity, right? He was alone in the desert. He was exhausted physically, emotionally, spiritually. He was tempted just like us, we humans are tempted. Jesus was tempted in the desert, a window, a window into his humanity. When we think about his divinity, we think about the miracles, what Jesus has accomplished in his earthly ministry, all his miracles, his healings. Think about the transfiguration in Matthew 17, right? Where Jesus's glory is on full display. We've seen aspects of Jesus's divinity and humanity all throughout Matthew. And again, we're going to see it in verses 36 through 46. These are very tender, very vulnerable verses of Jesus's, uh, of Jesus. In his 
stress as he contemplates and as he enters into this great moment of suffering where he's going to suffer humiliation and, um, you know, a painful, painful physical experience. So what happens? What's taking place here? Well, first in, in these verses, Jesus tells Peter and two sons of Zebedee um, that his soul has been overwhelmed with sorrow, even to the point of death. That's a powerful statement there. And Jesus asks them to keep watch with him. And of course, we know they don't keep watch with him. They fall asleep. It's a painful reminder of, excuse me, of how human they were. And by the way, lest we want to be on this moral high ground and, and level of superiority, it is also a picture of how painfully human we are. But Jesus, the son of God in these moments, is alone. He's about to face the most painful experience of his life. Arrest, humiliation, suffering, eventual death. And he's all alone. When you ponder that, when you think about that, what comes to mind? When you think about the Son of Man, the King of Glory, Jesus Christ, overwhelmed to the point of death, does it move you to worship and adoration of this suffering King? Does it give you confidence amidst the storms of life that Jesus has gone through hell for us? Does it give you a strange sort of peace or comfort? that Jesus has also experienced the tragedies of this life. Sit with that for a moment. Just sit with that. Ponder Jesus's experience in the Garden of Gethsemane. See him in his loneliness. The Son of Man was lonely. Jesus experienced loneliness, vulnerability, abandonment. He was facing betrayal from his friends, denial. Let it overwhelm your soul that Jesus experienced the worst for you and for me. If there were any thoughts, right, that God is somehow this distant deity that does not concern himself with the affairs of mankind, let these passages dispel that. The infinite has stepped in to the finite, totally, and he experiences intense suffering in these moments. Does that impact your soul? Because it should. This reality makes life bearable. It makes suffering worth it. In some mystery, it dispels our loneliness that we know that our Savior, our King and Master, has gone through the Garden of Gethsemane. I've heard pastors talk about this before. Maybe you have too, right? The Garden of Gethsemane tells us, it yells to us that we are not alone. I've heard so many pastors say that before. The Garden of Gethsemane tells us that we are not alone because Jesus has experienced loneliness. But we also serve a conquering king, right? We, we, serve, we serve the Jesus, the suffering servant who goes through the Garden of Gethsemane and who will also go through the imminent suffering of his arrest and humiliation before the religious leaders and his uh, walk on Calvary and his crucifixion on the cross. We have that suffering servant. We serve that suffering servant. But we also serve a conquering king. And Jesus actually prays to his father. He prays an honest prayer. Um, Right, The first prayer is, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. The second prayer, as one of our leaders acknowledged, um, Jesus changes it slightly and he says my father if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless i drink it may your will be done to his call he's going to be committed to what's going to happen jesus remains resolved to the father's plan and verse 45 ends with this jesus goes through this dark night of the soul and he stands up he resolves himself and he says to his disciples look the hour has come and the son of man is delivered into the hands of sinners rise let us go here comes my betrayer leaves us on a cliffhanger but i don't want to spoil anything for us but by the way the story does not end if you didn't know already the story does not end with the garden of gethsemane or the arrest of jesus and aren't you glad it does not end there as i mentioned we serve 
a king who has suffered, but we also serve a conquering king who died on the cross and rise, rises from the grave. We cannot forget the empty tomb. And this is going to lead here to our final principle that Jesus faithfully submitted to God's redemptive plans despite the pain of obedience. Jesus faithfully submitted to God's redemptive plans despite the pain of obedience. All right, so let's wrap up these passages of scripture. There's a lot to sift through in just a few short minutes. But uh, let's think about those questions again from the introduction, right? Where in your life do you need to be reminded of God's faithfulness? Where in your life do you need to experience God's redemption? And where in your life do you want to experience the freedom that comes from following Jesus? As I've mentioned before, we live in a fallen world. We are fallen human beings. Even for those of us who have followed, who follow, been following Christ for a long time, we still experience brokenness. We still experience sin. And this can often make us feel uncertain and hopeless because we are human beings. We, live, we have lived broken lives, all of us, in some way or another, and sometimes that can overwhelm us, can overwhelm our souls. And we can often be painfully aware of how we don't measure up to our standards, to the standards of others, certainly not to God's perfect standard. And that all might be true, right? Our, our pain is real. Our regret is real. The bitterness is a real thing. I understand that I'm not taking any of that away. When you think, you know, when I told you to think about some of those situations that have taken place in your life that you brought to the surface, right, that, that give us pain, that cause pain, those are real things that happen to us, right? I'm not trying to dispel any of that. But again, we have to know that Jesus does not let our story end there. Jesus, just as Jesus' mission did not end with the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus does not leave us with the weight of our sin to deal with. See Jesus with his disciples, right? See Jesus experience the heartache of betrayal from one of his own one of his own see him experience loneliness in his dark night of the soul as the weight of this world and the weight of our sin is thrust upon his shoulders in these moments and then see jesus persist see jesus go ahead onto the road towards calvary in it in excruciating pain suffering abandonment who in the joy set before him endures in perfect obedience and faithfulness to the Father's plans. Jesus completes the work of the cross. He completes our salvation. And on top of that, he rises again. He gives us victory, freedom, power. He gives us true life in the here and now and in the life to come. So what do we do with all of that? Well, if you are a believer who has trusted in Christ and you are struggling with believing that you have been forgiven from your sins, you're still wrestling with sins that you've been dealing with for a long time, can you just trust in the solid rock? And I'm preaching to myself as much as I'm telling you guys. When we were unfaithful, that was obedient to the Father's plan in the midst of our disobedience. Let's stop trying to earn God's salvation now, and let's just remember that our sacrifice that our relationship with Jesus is dependent on what has already taken place and what is and what Jesus has already accomplished on the cross. That is where our confidence, that is where our freedom, our redemption stems from. It doesn't stem from us. It doesn't start with us. It doesn't end with us. Our solid foundation is Jesus Christ and Jesus was 100% faithful, 100% obedient when we were not and he accomplishes the redemption that we could have never accomplished that's true now when we first got saved and that's true uh, that's true now as well in our relationship with him you might still sin yes you might still experience it but you have to go back to the gospel you don't try to earn or try to redeem yourself don't go back to the old ways continue to go back to the to the gospel. Remember when we were talking about communion as a way to remember the gospel, that idea of remembering our salvation our, and our redemption accomplished in Christ, that's something that we believers must do every single day. When we wake up in the morning, we got to remember, I live 
today in light of the redemption that has already been provided for me. And nothing, as Paul talks about in Romans, nothing can separate me from that. Nothing can separate me from Jesus. That is the reality. And why? Because Jesus was 100% faithful and 100% obedient because Jesus accomplished the complete redemption on the cross and in his resurrection. So that's for us believers. Those are some powerful truths that we can sink on. But for the unbeliever, right? For maybe maybe you can you would consider yourself a skeptic, maybe somebody who's searching or seeking out Christianity. Can I just say first and foremost, it is awesome that you are here. It is so awesome that you are here. Um I I love that you're watching this video. I love that you're listening to God's word, but you have to know that you still face a debt that you can never repay. And it is the sin debt that causes you to be separated from God. But don't stop there. Yes, you can consider your sin, consider the reality that you have sinned before a perfect and holy God, that you stand condemned, but it doesn't end there. If you're still living, if you're still listening to this, Jesus will not leave you in your sin if you come to him in repentance and trust. Repent right now and come to the one who can make you new, who can forgive you of your sins, who can give you new life, and who can give and provide for you that solid foundation so that you can experience what true obedience, what true faithfulness looks like, what true redemption looks like. Turn to Jesus now. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day where he makes things new in you. So with that, as we consider Jesus' redemption, how Jesus purchased our life and saved and redeemed us from sin and death, let's pray as we wrap up Matthew 26. Heavenly Father, I thank you for giving us this opportunity to dive into your word and to ponder certain amazing truths. Lord, I pray as we go through this week, um, no matter what it is that we're going through, maybe it's uncertainty or stressful situations, or maybe it's the pain of the past that keeps bubbling up to the surface. Lord, would you remind us of your redemption, of your faithfulness? Lord, would, would you remind us of the Garden of Gethsemane when you, the infinite God of the universe, steps into our finite and you suffer? You experience the suffering for us on our behalf. Lord, would we see you in the Garden of Gethsemane and be encouraged and receive peace and to remember that these were the initial steps that you took to be 100% obedient to the Father's plan and to accomplish our salvation on the cross and in the empty tomb. Thank you, Lord, for your word, and I thank you that you don't leave us in our sin, but you continue to grow us day by day, growing in grace, being reminded of your gospel day by day. And it's in your son's great name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for listening. Appreciate it. Uh, Have an awesome week. And uh, thanks again for listening to Matthew 26.